Now our next speaker is uh, Laura Quaya from, uh, this will sound very bad for Hungarian people, Eltvos Loran University. And this topic is very fascinating, is uh, basically bilingualism, but in dogs. And uh, the most fascinating things, thing is that uh, basically the dogs are awake and unrestrained and are all family dogs. So Laura, tell us about it. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question for you. Have you ever wondered if dogs can distinguish between Spanish and Hungarian? Maybe not, because it's a super specific question. <laughs> but I did. Why? Because of Kun Kun. Kun Kun is a border collie. And he was born and lived in Mexico City for five years. And then he moved to Budapest. What do you think? Do you think that Kun Kun can notice that the Hungarian sounds different than Spanish or not? It could be yes. Because, for example, babies can do it. And in a certain way, family dogs and babies are similar because both are, are uh, surrounded by humans and humans were talking and talking all the time, all the time. And in this example, dogs, they are in the same environment. But what happened with the dogs? All this speech is relevant or is only more as noise for them? So in this work, we test dogs' neural sensitivity to auditory regularities that characterize language. In this work, we use fragments from the little prints because of course the dogs can understand uh, specific words as their names, the uh, names of toys, commands. But here we can check if dogs can process in a certain way the language in general, how sounds the language. And we use for different kind of stimuli. First, we have in this example in Spanish a familiar language. For example, here. Sois como era mi zorro. No era más que un zorro semejante a cien mil otros. Pero yo le hice mi amigo y ahora es único en el mundo. And also in Hungarian. Egy másik bolygón. Igen. Nekem egy búzatábláról nem jut eszembe semmi. Te vagy a hibás, mondta. And as control, we use the same fragments, but in a scrambled way. So uh, this control stimuli maintain all the low level uh, uh, properties, but it uh, doesn't sound as um, language anymore. You can hear. And this is for the so with, uh, uh, with this uh, stimuli, we had uh, two questions. The first one was about speech detection. So we compare the cerebral activity uh, from the, both languages versus the scrambled stimuli. And then for looking for uh, language discrimination, we are looking for uh, cerebral regions that can discriminate between both languages, but not between both scrambled stimuli. And here are the results. In this experiment, participate 18 dogs. And first, I would like to focus in the red scale results. This is the primary auditory cortex and is uh, where is the distinction between a speech versus a scramble a speech. So in these regions uh, is the speech detection. But as you can see in this graph, in the primary auditory cortex is not a language discrimination. Uh, here I show in the ball signal change for all the stimuli. As you can see, uh, the, it, it is a difference in the response between a speech versus a scramble, but no uh, between the familiar and familiar language. They have a similar response. But now, if we focus in the blue scale regions, this is the secondary auditory cortex that is more rostral and ventral than the primary auditory cortex in the dog brain is the language discrimination. These regions can discriminate uh, the cerebral patterns between familiar language versus unfamiliar language, but, and this is important, not between the scramble stimuli. So indeed, no cerebral region can discriminate between the scramble stimuli. As conclusion, we describe a distinct stage of language perception in dogs. First, the speech detection uh, happened in the primary auditory cortex. 
And we suggest that this process is more about the naturalness processing. As you maybe remember, the scramble uh, st um, stimuli sounds very weird. So maybe the talk brain is detecting that this is not natural. It's not, uh, it's not necessary that this is language, no language, it's more about this. And then the language uh, discrimination in the secondary auditory cortex, we think is, uh, is uh, related with learning about auditory regularities. And indeed, this is pretty cool because we never teach to our dogs, okay, this is your familiar language. You need to learn something. And it's only by exposition to the environment that dogs learn this. So as an advice, remember, when you talk, uh, dogs are listening. Thank you so much for this. And now I'm ready for the interactive part. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I have to ask this. Uh, so since uh, the, the dogs were free, how the experiment did work? So how you managed to have them in the scanner staying uh, um, mm -hmm. calm and uh, managed to scan all these dogs? Uh, this is uh, super nice because all they are family dogs. So we usually contact to the families uh, in parks or by recommendation. And there is uh, uh, many uh, training sessions, but indeed uh, dogs are, so, are super social and cooperative. So when they understand that you are asking to stay super still, they tend to do it. And also all the time inside the scanner is uh, the owner and usually also the trainer. To, and uh, in this way, the uh, dog is, okay, if you say that it's safe and all seems uh, true, uh, we can do it. Okay, so apparently they are better subjects than uh, human subjects. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so we have already three questions, so I will start with those. Um, so the first one is uh, from Shreya Mishra and is, uh, would you expect biological continuity of this phenomenon to other house pets, uh, such as birds, cats, and mice? I think, uh, indeed, this is a super interesting question because one of our hypotheses, uh, in general, in this dog uh, cognition, is that the dogs are special. Uh, I are special in an evolutive way because we share a lot of environment, and indeed, the dogs, in comparison to other domestic animals, they were selected uh, for cooperate with humans. So maybe for all, it's an hypothesis, uh, and we are trying, well, not we, the people, are trying to test with, uh, for example, with wolf or other uh, species, but it seems that dogs, as uh, they are for cooperate with humans, so uh, we are important. So they are looking for cues to interpret us. So, uh, I, I will say that dogs are special, but in the first uh, level about the speech detection, maybe it's a more um, um, shared um, trait, but it's only an hypothesis. Yeah, it should be interesting because I think that last year a paper, uh, probably it was Journal of Neuroscience came out and it was about cats and humans. And basically, they found out that cats are more attached to, the, to their humans than uh, we thought. So uh, I would be curious to see what happens with cats. <laughs> so the next question is from uh, Carolina Shimabukuro. And is, uh, how long did it take to train all those dogs? Impressive work. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, mainly, it uh, depends on the uh, availability of the families. So if the family say, okay, one per week, I can do it, uh, usually to less than three months. And it's uh, super easy. And I think with the dogs in comparison with other species is they need short sessions. So this is a little more session, but short, and then it's uh, super nice and easy to uh, continue work with them. To follow up on this, uh, I didn't ask, but uh, were they uh, normal fMRI sequences or maybe were like the silent ones so the dogs uh, wouldn't hear uh, all those noises? Uh, usually uh, we use with uh, visual stimuli uh, with the, the normal one and indeed is the normal scanner. But uh, with, in this specific experiment, we use uh, sparse sampling. So it's less uh, noise from the scanner 
and more silence to hear the stimuli. And it, it's super nice because as you can see in this photo, the uh, coil that we are use is for babies in the reality. It's for the torso of babies, but it's super nice for the dogs because they put in this way. Uh, <laughs> it is also kind of peculiar that I asked a question that uh, Clement Garin just asked. <laughs> yes. He actually added about the coil, so basically we asked. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, yes, uh, so, uh, there is also a flex uh, coil, then they are two cycles, and it's super easy because you put uh, in both, and it's super nice because it's easy for the dogs and don't feel as a trap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the next question is from uh, Alexei Krotov that says, Great talk. I heard the idea before that uh, the dogs react mostly to sequences of vowels. Do you think that your findings support that claim, regardless of the language? Mm, I think not necessary our work because it's speech in general. And the, but I think it's interesting, but unfortunately with our data, we cannot uh, say more, uh, more with our specific. But uh, of course, there are other uh, studies that show that uh, dogs can detect uh, then one word is different from another only for one vowel. So I think it's uh, super nice. Okay. And then we have uh, Minye and Zan. Do the dogs move their ears in the scanner? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a, a little difficult because they are using earphones for protection about the noise uh, as humans and also to present the stimuli. And it, it could be uh, indeed but we are using a threshold and maximum, the dogs can move three millimeters. So I think it could be, but uh, we are worried about the noise, so we are protecting, so we cannot see. Okay. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. And then we have another question from Clement Garin, and is, uh, is there a way to avoid the important artifacts in the frontal area in dogs' bold images? Did you have uh, some kind of artifacts <laughs> to get rid of? Uh, we know, uh, we uh, didn't know, and this is indeed a super good uh, question and it's a problem in the dog uh, uh, field because uh, for the, as you know, the air is introducing these uh, artifacts and we have as humans here air and a little in the front of but now imagining the dogs with this large nose, uh, so this is a problem, but indeed the, the, in Emory, in the Emory University, the Burns team, they are de develop a specific um, a sequence to try to avoid these artifacts. So we are here more interested in the auditory cortex, but we not, but other teams, yes, they are improving. The okay, uh, yeah, that's interesting. So now I have two questions from Dion Lu. I will try to make one so we don't go over time. So the first one is how many dog species are included in the experiment? Is there some differences among dog species in the ability of language detection and discrimination? And then the other one is uh, we see there is a shift of the location of both the red region and blue region in speech detection and discrimination. Do you have some intuition on what is shifted and what might be the regions in between are responsible? Mm -hmm. So in the first one, it was mainly uh, the uh, cooperative breeds, we say. So uh, most of them, they are in a medium size and the most they are border collies, honestly, because they are super easy to train, super, super easy. And it is difficult to know if they are uh, different in the ability because is, they are dogs. All dogs uh, want to cooperate with humans, but also they are reports and they, it could be some differences uh, between breeds. So here we are only uh, focused in the uh, cooperative ones. But I think I will hypothesis, uh, my hypothesis is not, they are no different because it's a more uh, basic uh, process. So okay. maybe for learning specific words or what they do with this uh, learning, it could be, but in this point, I think not. And the last one is, um, is about the, um, the inter uh, areas. Uh, we are uh, we are super sure about the primary auditory cortex. 
So we say, this is the primary auditory cortex, but in the other regions, it's a little more complex to determine what is secondary and not secondary. Mm -hmm. So we are, we think that the main process is in this region and is uh, the, the real focus is in the primary auditory cortex for speech detection. Okay. okay. Well, that's, well, that's, that's fine. <laughs> and thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. And uh, let's move on to our...